Hey guys, Maywit here, and today I have some more stories about missionaries and cars for you. This first story takes place in Sydney, Montana in early 2019. It was winters and the roads were pretty slick. I had two companions, elder cars who I talked about in a previous story, and a greenie or new missionary that we were training whom we will call Elder Watts. Elder Watts and elder cars would alternate who would drive each week. I didn't want to drive so I usually sat in the back where I would sleep or mess around on my phone. Every so often when Elder Cars was driving, he would turn to Elder Watts and say, Alright, don't do this, but... And then he would do a donut or drift in, on a turn in like an empty parking lot or an empty street. Now, Elder Cars is really smart when it comes to cars, and he's a really good driver, so I never felt unsafe or anything like that when he did that. And honestly, it was pretty fun. Well, one day, Elder Watts is driving, and he decides he wants to do a drift. So he asks Elder Cars how to do it, and Elder Cars tells him how. Elder Watts tries it on a turn in an empty street, but unfortunately, the drip was too wide and he ended up hitting a mailbox that was embedded in a brick structure. Nobody was hurt, so the three of us got out to assess the damage. The mailbox was completely unscathed, but the car most certainly was not. It had a dent and some scratches, and since the mailbox was unharmed and the people weren't home, uh, we went to the church parking lot and called the vehicle coordinator from, from the church parking lot. I had the SIM card in my phone due to an agreement with the other two in exchange for never driving, so I was the one who made the call. I told him that we slipped and hit a brick mailbox that didn't our car, but not the mailbox. He told us to take pictures of the car and fill out the online form and go through that process I mentioned in part one of this series. So we go into the church and use one of the computers there to fill out the form. Since Elder Watts was driving, he's the one who fills out the form. Obviously, it's boring to watch someone else fill out paperwork. So, Elder Cars used the other computer and I messed around on my phone. Every so often I'd look up to see how Elder Watts was doing, you know, see, see if he needed help or anything like that. It was a good thing I did, because in the explanation section he wrote, We drifted into a brick mailbox and dented our car. The drift was deliberate, and as soon as I see that, I, um, <clears throat> I stop Elder Watts and to explain some stuff to him. Uh, you see, one of the dumbest mission rules is that you are responsible for the actions of your companion... And this is doubly true if your companion is a greenie and you're training him. So if Elder Watts admitted that the drift was deliberate, not only would he lose his driving privileges for being reckless, but Elder Cars and I would also lose them as punishment for not stopping him. And not having a car out in Montana in the middle of the winter when it's like negative 20 is not a fun time. Now, you could argue that Elder Cars deserved some blame for teaching Elder Watts how to drift, um, personally, I don't think he deserves any blame, but I, I could see the argument. However, me, I, I was in the back seat, and I had no idea he was going to drift up until, like, right before he did it. Furthermore, I never got why the mission punishment for being a bad passenger, as they called it, was to take away your driving privileges and make you a permanent passenger. Like, to me, that's like punishing an employee that's stealing by making them work the register. So just to be clear though, I never told Elder Watts to remove the part about the drift being deliberate. I just told him what would happen if he left it there, and Elder Cars confirmed that what I said was true. And so Elder Watts chose to remove it from the explanation. After all, the explanation doesn't ask for such details, so what's the point in including them? We later had to take the car into a shop to get repaired, but since Salt Lake assumed that was an accident due to the slippery roads and the damage was less than $4,000, the only punishment was Elder Watts was just not allowed to drive for a short time. This next story happened a few months before I arrived on my mission, but it's the most expensive car accident in my mission's history, so it got told to every greenie as a cautionary tale when I arrived. A missionary that we'll call Elder Minor was driving on a residential street in a city. He didn't like what song was playing, so he adjusted it. Unfortunately, in doing so, he took his eyes off the road long enough that he hit a parked car. That car then hit another car, which hit another car, which hit another. Counting Elder Miner's car, five cars in total were damaged. Elder Miner knew he was in deep crap, so when he called the vehicle coordinator and filled out the online form, he claimed that a car was coming in the opposite direction and it went over the yellow line, so he swerved to avoid hitting it in a head-on collision. His companion claimed he was asleep and didn't notice anything. Well, the total damage was around $60,000. So, naturally, an investigation was done to find this mysterious other car. Unfortunately for Elder Minor, there was a house facing the street that had a security system which recorded the whole thing. 
The video showed that there was no other car at all, let alone one that went across the, the line. So now, not only was Elder Miner in trouble for causing a lot of property damage, but he was now in trouble for lying about it. In the end, Elder Miner lost his driving privileges for the rest of his mission. If I recall correctly, I think he also spent most of the remainder of his mission in crappy areas as well. I could be wrong about that though, they never explicitly said that they did that to him, I think it was just like an observation that I made. As for his companion at the time, I forgot who it was or what happened to him. Assuming the standard punishment was applied, he also lost his driving privileges for the rest of his mission, which, again, makes no sense to me. This last story also took place before I got to the mission, but it's another big one, so it gets told a lot. Before we had the devices put in our cars that monitor our driving, make sure we're going the speed limit and all that, it was very common for missionaries to do what they called baptizing and confirming cars. You baptize a car by driving it 100 miles per hour or faster, and confirm it by taking a picture of the speedometer while doing so. So one day, a missionary was baptizing a car, and I believe he was going somewhere between 110 and 120 miles per hour. Keep in mind that the top speed limit in North Dakota is 75 miles per hour. So, at minimum, he's going at least 35 over. Unfortunately for this missionary, he drove past a cop and got pulled over. And apparently, when you go that much over the speed limit, you don't get a ticket. They arrest you on the spot for reckless driving. So he gets arrested, and his companion calls the mission president in order to figure out what to do. The mission president asks him why he didn't stop his companion from going that fast, because again, you are responsible for the actions of your companion. The companion said he was asleep, which, now that I think about it, seems to be the dog-ate-my-homework excuse for us missionaries. The mission president didn't buy that excuse, of course, and after the phone call, he turns to another missionary that was in the office with him and says, He says he was sleeping. You know what that is, Elder? BULLSHIT! I'm sorry for my language, but that's BULLSHIT! As for what happened next, there happened to be a member of the local congregation that was a lawyer. So the mission president called them and explained the situation. The lawyer went down to the police station, or wherever it was that the missionary was being held in, and had a conversation with the cops. The lawyer explained that they could either charge the missionary with reckless driving, throw him in jail for a bit, slap him with a fine, ruin his life, you know, whatever. Or, they could make him finish out the remaining 18 months of his volunteer mission, where he would most certainly lose his driving privileges, have to follow a rigorous schedule that includes getting up at 6.30 in the morning, and doing 5-10 to 10 hours of community service per week. Well, believe it or not, the police actually chose the latter, and the missionary was never charged. I guess the police thought being a missionary was a worse punishment than being in jail. Those are my stories for today. I hope you enjoyed them, and if you did, please leave a comment down below, and please like, share, and subscribe for more.